Please join me in prayer. Holy Spirit, may the words of our mouths, the thoughts and meditations of our hearts, and the actions that we take in the world around us be rooted in you. Amen. So, as some of you know, or may recall, I was uh, out of town the second half of Sunday, and then all of Monday, and then most of Tuesday, at a retreat. And when I say retreat, it sounds very relaxing, uh, and this is not. Uh, this was the culmination of nine months of this stage of coach training I've been going through um, for multiple reasons, including um, I'm going to be working with the Presbytery to go out to congregations and provide coaching for them. So we're working on the details of that situation. I think it'll be pretty interesting. I'm looking forward to it. But this was long days of training and practicing and discussion and all sorts of things. So not very restful. And when I go to something like this, um, I try to kind of unplug. Like I don't check social media. I don't watch or listen to the news. Um, I try to focus on the people I'm there with. I try to, you know, as an introvert, I push myself to be social. So I try to be social, um, which is rewarding but tiring for someone like me. And uh, so I wasn't aware of what was going on. I was unplugged. And I did get one upset phone call during my time there that clued me in on what was going on. Um, but then when I kind of plugged back in, at the end of this retreat, uh, and I heard about the news coming out of the Supreme Court, that there was this leaked draft decision um, to overturn Roe v. Wade. And so I thought, okay. Um, this is the culmination. Uh, we talked about, and this has been on the news all week. Now that I'm plugged back in, I cannot avoid it to save my life. So this is the culmination of 40 or 50 years of very dedicated activism uh, and, and politicking uh, for those who wanted this result, who wanted to overturn Roe v. Wade. Um, for decades, uh, honestly, we've put up with a lot in our leaders because this was the one issue that was seen as the required qualification for, um, for people to be put up and to, to win primaries and etc. Um, and for the sake of that, I would honestly say we've had other things uh, go wrong for us. In the United States, uh, depending on how you ask, a large majority of people disagree with this prospect. Depending on how you ask, it's anywhere from 65% to 80% of Americans think this is a bad idea. However, for particularly the majority of white evangelicals and a large minority of Roman Catholics, uh, this is something to celebrate. This is a long fought generational victory for, for them. And so in response to this news from the Supreme Court, we have millions of people who are celebrating. And we have millions more people who are in anguish and fear and despair as a result of this pending decision. It's a draft decision, but it kind of shows us that they've already decided this case before a case arrives in the Supreme Court. It's like they've made up their mind ahead of time. Which, for those of us who have been paying attention, is not at all surprising. We know who these nine justices are. This anguish and fear and despair varies wildly depending on what state you currently live in. Um, some people in some states feel quite safe. Some people in some states are looking at moving or what they can do. In the Presbyterian Church USA, uh, as far back as we have statements about the issue of abortion, um, there has been room for people who are quote unquote pro-life and people who are quote unquote pro-choice I use quote-unquote because those categories are 
imposed on us as a way to divide us against each other for political gain. So I, they're descriptive, but they're not super helpful for actually talking to people. But they're, they're the shorthand that we had, so I'll use them. But there's been room in the PCUSA for pro-life and pro-choice members and pro-life and pro-choice leaders, both. For, for decades, this has been the case. Surely in this room, we have disagreement on YouTube, I'm certain, uh, among members of the congregation who are not here. If we go a couple blocks in every direction and ask our neighbors, we're gonna get very different ideas about this issue. Uh, back in 1970, the General Assembly made its first statement on abortion that I'm aware of. This is, for context, this is three years before Roe v. Wade. So this is at a time when, in many parts of the country, abortion was illegal. And so in 1970, among other things, the General Assembly of the Church said the following. The artificial or induced termination of a pregnancy is a matter of careful, ethical decision of the patient, and therefore should not be restricted by law. So that was our first, earliest statement that I could find. Um, obviously this was heating up as a social issue at the time. More recently, the Presbyterian Church's General Assembly Mission Agency has expanded on this um, and kind of collected together multiple statements the denomination has made on this issue. Um, and it's a little bit long, but I'm gonna, just, I'm gonna just share it with you. Because the position of the Presbyterian Church USA has been very consistent for 50 years, 52 years now. And so you don't have to agree with it or disagree with it, but I wanna share it. It is as follows as of their most recent publication. The church ought to be able to maintain within its fellowship those who, on the basis of a study of scripture and prayerful decision, continue to come to diverse conclusions and actions. Problem pregnancies are the result of, and influenced by, so many complicated and insolvable circumstances that we have neither the wisdom nor the authority to address or decide each situation. We affirm the ability and responsibility of women, guided by the scriptures and the Holy Spirit, in the context of their communities of faith, to make good moral choices in regard to problem pregnancies. We call upon Presbyterians to work for a decrease in the number of problem pregnancies, thereby decreasing the number of abortions. The considered decision of a woman to terminate a pregnancy can be morally acceptable, though certainly it is not the only or required decision. Possible justifying circumstances would include medical indications of severe physical or mental deformity, conception as a result of rape or incest, or conditions under which the physical or mental health of either woman or child would be gravely threatened. We are disturbed by abortions that seem to be elected only as a convenience or to ease embarrassment. We affirm that abortion should not be used as a method of birth control. Abortion is not morally acceptable for gender selection only or solely to obtain fetal parts for transplantation. We reject the use of violence and or abusive language either in protest of or in support of abortion. The strong Christian presumption is that since all life is precious to God, we are to preserve and protect it. Abortion ought to be an option of last resort. The Christian community must be concerned about and address the circumstances that bring a woman to consider abortion as the best available option. Poverty, unjust societal realities, sexism, racism, and inadequate supportive relationships may render a woman virtually powerless to choose freely. Not flowery, but there it is. There's a lot more to say here, um, but not, I think, in this sermon. Rather, I'm going to circle around, and uh, I'm going to say that I'm confident that people on different sides of this issue 
largely think and believe, that what they're doing is they're listening to the voice of the Good Shepherd, and they're following that voice to the best of their ability. Turning to our scripture readings this morning, who is it that we meet in our text from Revelation? These white-robed kind of masses uh, worshiping God in quite verbose ways, I thought, in the text. Kind of a run-on praise of God, right? These are people who have come through the Great Tribulation. So if we think about the time period that the Gospel of John was probably written, this would be after the destruction of Jerusalem, after the destruction of the Temple, which would have killed a lot of Christian leaders and scattered them. It would have also killed and scattered, obviously, Jewish leadership. Um, and at this time, we still have a situation where Judaism and Christianity are they're pulling apart, but they're still very similar, um, enough that like Romans couldn't tell the difference between the two of them at this point. This is a culmination text, right? This is uh, John of Patmos, remember from last week, seeing a vision of the culmination of history and time and God's providence. And so all peoples from the whole of the known world are gathered together in this great multitude, praising God in heaven. You know, John asks, uh, or John is asked coyly, you know, these people are, and he says, you know. And then he's told that these are the people from all languages and all cultures and all lands who have been gathered together here, and they worship God day and night. A way of thinking of them is that this is the collection of all the people throughout time who have ever heard Jesus' voice or who will ever hear it. They're all gathered together in this, in this time and in this place. We have our text from the Gospel of John, where Jesus, in one of many places, talks about himself as the Good Shepherd. And I like Jesus' style of leadership in that he's not really concerned with having large numbers of people support him. Like he's not altering his message so that more people will find it palatable so he can get a large turnout when he speaks. It's a very, um, in family systems parlance, he's very self-differentiated. Right? He's saying that I am the good shepherd. And the people, my people, my sheep, hear my voice. And they respond to it. And so he is the good shepherd, and Revelation is the collection of all the people who have ever heard his voice and responded to it. Now, as I talked about with the kids, um, in this time and place, there were lots of shepherds. Like Jesus' audience, a lot of them would have been agricultural workers, maybe a few landowners, so lots of people in olive groves, lots of people in olive and wine presses, lots of people who were shepherding, and so lots of people who were fishing. Those were big industries in his area. So he would use these shepherd examples, and there'd be shepherds in the audience nodding their heads and understand what's going on. Sheep and goats need a shepherd. It's not their fault they've been selectively bred that way. <laughs> like, they're different from their wild ancestors. Like, Bighorn sheep don't need a shepherd. They're wild animals. But domestic sheep need a shepherd. They need a shepherd to show them where the food is. They need a shepherd to bring them to water and to know where water is out in the desert. They need a shepherd to fend off predators because they're pretty helpless by themselves. Sheep and goats need a shepherd to flourish. They need to be able to see the shepherd, hear the shepherd's voice, and respond to the shepherd's instructions. In order to do this, sheep also have to be free. Like, so if sheep are out there listening for the, the shepherd's voice, they're also out there to be bitten by vipers. They're out there to be eaten by wolves or coyotes. They're out there to fall into ravines and get stuck, break their legs. Um, they're taking on this risk but if they're free to have this risk and they follow the shepherd's voice, they can flourish. 
Some of you may remember from curiosity class or uh, Sunday school or previous sermons that the Presbyterian Church USA is a reformed tradition. Just familiar language to anyone I'm curious in the room. A few nodding heads, a few blanks, that's okay. So we are part of the reformed tradition uh, that emerged in the 1500s and 1600s as a rebellion from the Catholic Church. And one of the really important things about the reformed tradition is freedom of conscience. Freedom of conscience. And it makes sense. The people who were the original reformers, the original rebellious monks, for the most part, rebellious priests, rebelled because their consciences demanded it. Martin Luther would probably have preferred to just had an inward reformation in the Roman Catholic Church, adjusted some of the things they were doing and kept going with his life on a good trajectory. But it came to the point where his conscience wouldn't let him do that. And they cornered him and drew a line, and he said, okay, I choose my side. Similar story for John Knox, similar story for John Calvin. Their consciences drove them to rebel. They couldn't stay where they are, they had to go elsewhere. And so, in the system they created, in the tradition they created, freedom of conscience is really important. Whether you're different kinds of reform. Lutheran, Methodist, UCC, etc. This idea is a huge deal. You'll notice that we like to vote a lot as Presbyterians. We use Robert's Rules of Order. We have committee meetings and we vote. And then we bring things to session and session votes. And we bring things to the congregation and the congregation votes. We vote on electing elders to session. We vote on electing deacons to the Board of Deacons. We vote on ordaining pastors. We vote on moving pastors from presbytery to presbytery. For me to be here where I am now, there were at least five votes. A vote to ordain me, a vote to move me to this presbytery, and then you had the pleasure of three of your own votes that you got to have <laughs> over the issue of whether I would stay. I say that ironically. I don't think they were pleasurable, but you got to vote. When we have our annual congregational meeting, you vote on my terms of call. The session votes on whether someone gets to be baptized here. The session votes on whether someone gets to join the church. And we use this process of deliberation because we, our tradition teaches us, and hopefully we believe, that it's up to us to listen for God's voice, to listen for the Holy Spirit and to discern for ourselves what is right. And so I read to you a statement from the General Assembly. This statement doesn't have weight. You don't have to agree with it. You don't have to behave in line with it. It's a suggestion. It's an elaborate suggestion. You still get to vote. You get to decide for yourselves. We presume in everything that we do as Presbyterians, whether you're a little bit Presbyterian or very deeply Presbyterian, when we do things here, we presume that everyone is listening for God's voice and everyone is discerning. And then when we come together, we can hear God's voice more clearly. That's what we believe. And so, as you know, when we do that, we disagree. Every vote isn't unanimous. Because it turns out when you set everyone free to decide for themselves what is best, they don't agree with each other very often. That's just how it is. I don't know how to avoid that. And so I'm certain that we dis disagree on, for example, abortion. The decision of Roe v. Wade, the decision to overturn it, I'm certain that we disagree on that. Although, I will say, I think we are much closer than we believe. Remember that it's in the interest of people in power to make sure that we are angry and scared and divided from one another. And so that's where their effort goes. I think there's a lot we could agree on. We probably agree that uh, 
we should have good prenatal care and good maternal health care and parental leave and a robust adoption and foster system and good early childhood education and all these things. I imagine we're close on all those issues. And we can work together on those things while disagreeing on others. But at the heart of our tradition is the idea that we each are responsible to listen for the voice of the Good Shepherd. And if we listen and we respond, we look ahead to that great multitude in Revelation, and we hope that we too can be part of it. But there isn't any allowance for us to force one another to do things that are against our conscience. And that to me is the danger of this Supreme Court decision. It's a continuation of a process which takes away that chance to decide for ourselves. Amen.